Good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I would like to thank first the Department of Political Science and the Center for uh, Social Science Scholarship for co-hosting this talk. And uh, what I'll do today is try to sort of start with a puzzle about the Constitution, which hopefully in about 45 minutes I can answer. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're celebrating the Constitution's 234th birthday, and that's a bit unusual because if you look at other national constitutions, they don't last nearly this long. The United States Constitution is an extraordinary outlier in that it's really, really old. So my question for this talk is, how has the Constitution survived for almost a quarter of a millennium? How has it survived a civil war, periods of internal crisis, economic collapse? How has the United States come to have the world's oldest written national constitution? Not only is the US Constitution older than all other national documents, it's also older than the state documents. <clears throat> so when you compare the US Constitution to the state constitutions, the stability of the national document really comes into focus. The states, you see a lot more constitutional turnover. There have been at least 411 attempts to draft new state constitutions. 144 of them have been ratified. There have been 255 different bodies gathered in convention to write new state constitutions. And similarly, you see a lot more amendment happening at the state level. There have been at least uh, 7,695 uh, 7, uh, amendments to the current 50 state constitutions. Uh, relative to the 27 amendments ratified at the federal level. And state constitutions have much shorter lifespans, a little more than half of the lifespan of the federal constitution. So, so why is this? Why do we have this system where we have a really stable federal constitution and a lot of instability in the state constitutions? So I'm going to try to answer that over the course of this lecture, and I'm going to do it with a special emphasis on voting in the United States, which is something that's becoming more and more important now as we see protections for the right to vote increasingly rolled back, especially at the state level, with a uh, topic on which I'm going to close today's lecture. Uh, so uh, I'll try to give an answer for why I think we get this sort of federal stability and, and state constitutional instability. But first what I'll do is I'll give you a few kind of common stories about why uh, the Constitution has survived for so long. Uh, and I'll try to kind of walk through the normal stories, then I'll give my own story and give you probably two case studies that, that can uh, unpack my claims or try to give some evidence for the claims I'm making. So first, what's the normal story of why we have a Constitution that's lasted for so long? One story is that you get controversy that could press for constitutional change emerging at the national level, and national actors will step up to the plate and either resolve or fail to resolve these national constitutional controversies. The Supreme Court, for example, can step in and act as an arbiter in ways that define constitutional meaning and either create instability or stability at the national level. Either the federal court uh, successfully resolves or fails to resolve these national questions. But one point that I want to make is that we have these 50 other state constitutions which are addressing these nationally salient issues in the same way, sometimes causing a lot of the outcomes that we're attributing to the national branches. And if we're ignoring this state constitutionalism, then sometimes we can attribute outcomes to national political actors that those national political actors are not actually causing. So if we ignore state constitutions, we're also not correctly understanding national politics in the United States. The two don't exist in isolation. And we have this habit of only looking at sort of this top pattern, but by ignoring this parallel pattern below, we're missing how the top pattern actually works. So we'll try to kind of unpack that claim. The normal story is then about the federal constitution, these stories that don't include the states. What do those stories look like? Uh, one answer for why we've had this constitution, the same federal constitution for 234 years, is that it's really, really hard to amend. You need two-thirds of both houses of Congress or two-thirds of a convention called by the states, a convention called by two-thirds of the states, and then ratification by three-quarters of the states and legislature or convention. It's the highest part of amendment out of any national constitution. So that might be why we see so little amendment. But the thing about constitutions that are hard to amend, at least when you compare them, is that the ones that are very hard to sort of bend or amend, they tend to snap, they're brittle, right? So you want constitutions that bend so they don't break. In this sense, the US Constitution's an outlier. It's the hardest national constitution to amend in the world. That means it should probably have the shortest lifespan. So I don't think this answer is really compelling. <coughs> so another answer might be, instead of amendment, we just take issues to the Supreme Court to resolve constitutional meaning or to Congress. Sometimes Congress will pass statutes, non-constitutional laws that still help us determine constitutional meaning. And I think that's, again, a 
decent story, but remember that if we're only looking at national actors, we're still not fully understanding the process. So I don't think we can look only at national actors like uh, federal judiciary, the federal judiciary, or Congress's statutory lawmaking power in order to understand the, the uh, survival of the U.S. Constitution. So there's one other reason, and I think this is, is maybe the best of the three, which is that the public really venerates the U.S. Constitution. So if, if you go down to the National Archives in the gift shop, you can buy the text uh, on the, you can buy a baseball with the text of the Constitution, you can buy a rain poncho, you can buy a gift bag from the gift shop uh, with the text of the Constitution on it. And as a British friend explained to me last week, that's really weird. Right? <laughs> Americans are unique in our veneration for the Constitution. Uh, we, we put it on everything. And, you know, rarely do, do we fully understand its meaning, but there is this broad public uh, culture of constitutional veneration, uh, which James Madison says, you know, uh, um, grants uh, longevity to the Constitution. So that might explain part of it, and I think that, again, sort of helpful in understanding the uh, longevity of the Constitution, but I'll give a different story here. So what I think is, is that uh, more often we see that nationally salient political issues, national constitutional constitutional controversies are often strategically pushed on the states in ways that bring about state constitutional change and prevent change to the national constitution. That we see issues um, that could be resolved at the national level instead of being resolved at the state level, preventing change to the national constitution, bringing about change at the state constitutional level. So I'm going to try to break that down for a little bit, explaining what this process looks like kind of give a broad theory and a, a little bit of sort of over uh, uh, evidence, giving an overview of that before I give kind of two uh, short stories on how this process might work. So in the book, I have this four-part typology, and I'm going to go through it kind of quickly here because y'all don't you know, need the nuts and bolts unless y'all want them. But we can imagine that nationally salient political issues emerge at the national level and result only in national reform. And this occurs sometimes. The Constitution says there are some things that can't be resolved at the state level. States, for example, cannot raise armies and navies. They're forbidden from doing it. Uh, and largely, they, they don't. Um, Kentucky's 1891 state constitution creates a Kentucky Navy. There's no real reason for that to exist, and it's also constitutionally forbidden. For the most part, that kind of thing doesn't actually happen. Instead, you know, we see a lot of issues involving the states uh, in areas that are kind of subject to overlapping regulation, what are called concurrent powers. The constitution under the 10th Amendment creates these broad powers, and it says that powers that aren't granted to the federal government or reserved to the states, uh, I'm sorry, uh, forbidden to the states, can be regulated at the state level. And what this means is that the states and the federal government can regulate a lot of issues together. So we can imagine an issue that's nationally salient, emerges at the national level, and then gets pushed down to the state level. Uh, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, there was this big anti-tax balance budget movement, which failed largely in Congress, but created all of these state-level reforms uh, restricting um, uh, budgeting and, and taxation powers. We can also imagine uh, a nationally salient, a nationally important issue emerging in the states and then kind of filtering up uh, in a process I call elevation that results in um, change at the national level. States can converge on a policy, for example, and I'll give two examples of that today uh, around voting rights, in ways that we see members of the Supreme Court or Congress imitating, trying to entrench a national platform that has more or less already emerged at the state level. Finally, we can imagine the states entirely obviating or preventing federal level action. A nationally salient issue emerges at the state level and is only ever addressed at the state level. A lot of voting rights reform, nationally salient, was really only addressed at the state level prior to the Civil War in American political history. So those are, I think, kind of the overall types of things that could happen. Importantly, most paths for change at some point involve the state level. They're in that last three categories, those uh, final three categories. Uh, so most paths to change will go through the states. So what I'll do now is, is try to give you a sense of why that might be. Uh, for one, again, it's really hard to amend the U.S. Constitution. You need to propose an amendment, two-thirds of both houses of Congress. So you need to have uh, either be above or below this line. The y-axis just gives you the percent of uh, Congress that's either Democratic or prior to 1832 Democratic or Republican. So rarely do you actually get these really big congressional supermajorities necessary to propose an amendment. Very hard to do. For most of American political history, you're kind of stuck between those two boundaries. So an amendment, largely not viable. If you go to the National Archives, which you know, I guess it's, I'm sort of adding myself, I go there a lot. Um, you can see there's uh, an exhibit with uh, um, 
proposed amendments before Congress. There have been 11,970 proposed amendments up to 2020. 33 of them passed Congress, six of those failed ratification, 27 of them were ratified. 0.02% success rate. So, not likely that an amendment passes Congress. Much easier to pass amendments at the state level. Uh, in nearly all states, an amendment can be uh, can pass with a simple majority in the legislature. In most states, it also needs approval by the voters. In addition to amending state constitutions, uh, which, by the way, amendments at the state constitutional level, much higher success rate of, of the uh, current um, 50 state constitutions. Uh, we've had 11, uh, sorry, 7,695 amendments ratified as of 2020 out of just over 11,000 uh, proposed. So on average, state constitutional amendments succeed. You can also entirely replace state constitutions. <coughs> Very easy to do. Just under half of the bodies assembled to entirely rewrite state constitutions have, have succeeded in passing new documents. So there's an active culture of rewriting state constitutions. State constitutions, as a result, are really, really big documents. Uh, they are uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of words. Um, so the U.S. Constitution clocks in at 7,800 words. The Alabama Constitution, which I collect state constitutions, I don't have a copy of this because the shipping is too expensive. It costs 388, I'm sorry, it is 388,000 words. It's the size of a phone book. Uh, this is the original Alabama 1901 Constitution. There are a lot of problems in this document, which are we're going to talk about later. Um, really long documents, so they're, they're full of all of these provisions, which over time they get outdated and need replacement, and so state constitutions get stuck in this churn of constant amendment. They're always being rewritten, and usually there are amendments added on top of old amendments, which is how you get a document that looks like this. As a result, there's no culture of veneration around the state constitutions. While the public is aware of the U.S. Constitution and sometimes made to venerate the Constitution in public moments like this. Those things don't exist at the state level, right? Only 52% of Americans think state constitutions exist. They do, that's the one thing that you should take away from this lecture. Um, the public, though, not being aware that state constitutions exist, generally has fewer reservations with state constitutional amendment. There's less of a culture around uh, prohibition of state constitutional amendment, although you see some interregional variation around that. What this means is that a lot of change gets pushed down to the state level. State constitutions are so much easier to change that if you're trying to make constitutional change in the US, you're probably not gonna succeed at the national level, but you certainly can succeed somewhere at the state level. And that's one of the stories I'll try to tell. So I'll give you for just a second a little bit of aggregate evidence and how I think this might be happening. Uh, I look at all of the proposed federal constitutional amendments, 1788 to, 19, uh, to 2020, 11,970 of those. And I also look at the proposed uh, state constitutions, as well as amendments to the state constitutions from 1942 up to um, 2020 uh, by anyway. Uh, and what you look at, uh, what you see when you look at these, is that generally the two move together in tandem. When there are more federal amendments being proposed, there are more state constitutional amendments being proposed. When one increases, the other increases. One way to measure this is a simple kind of, uh, a single measure is just by looking at um, the correlation between the two, the Pearson's correlation coefficient, which is 0 0.67 and positive, which means there's a strong and positive direction uh, between the two. When one increases, it's very likely the other increases. Or to put it differently, it's pretty unlikely that uh, there's no relationship between federal and state amendment. And similarly, between federal amendment and wholesale state replacement, that's the dashed line here, uh, federal amendment's the solid line, you see the two increase together, especially in periods of crisis, uh, civil war, civil rights uh, movement, which we will talk about later. So, similarly strong correlation between federal amendment and, and state constitutional replacement, 0 0.67, um, which suggests again that the two are moving together. But really what I'm interested in showing is that you are seeing federal amendment and state constitutional change happening on the same kinds of topics. When there's attempts to revise the federal constitution on one topic, you'll also see attempts to revise the state constitutions on those topics. So we break down the federal amendments by issue area. There's a whole lot of mess here. A lot of different things are being proposed over time. A lot of these amendments are not serious or viable. There's an 18, 
94 Amendment to rename the United States of America the United States of the world, which I think kind of speaks to America's colonial ambitions at the time, but also is not really a serious proposal. There are, there are however, in this, uh, if you put them all together, you'll kind of get a sense of what people are thinking about constitutionally at a given time. So these are the amendments relating to structures and powers of the federal government, and you can also see amendments relating to civil rights and civil liberties over time. And, and what I do through the book is I take a specific area, in this case I've got school regulation that peaks uh, just after uh, the Brown vs. Board decision where Congress, you have conservatives in Congress with strong backlash to Brown. So what I do in the book is, is I take specific issue areas and I see, I ask if this is happening at the national level, are states successfully tackling this issue? So I'll give you two stories now, which kind of, I, I think, casts and, and hopefully demonstrates the story that I'm trying to give. Uh, in which state constitutions can resolve national political issues, and they both deal with voting rights. The first story has to do with the long fight for the 19th Amendment. The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution forbids discrimination in the right to vote on the basis of sex, forbids disenfranchisement uh, on the basis of sex. The second thing I'll talk about deals with the poll tax. The poll tax was a race-based tool of disenfranchisement that required that people put down a dollar or two uh, when coming to the polls. It was uh, used predominantly in ex-Confederate southern states in the Jim Crow era to disenfranchise black people, especially black people. Um, so I'll talk first about the 19th Amendment. We'll go from like the 1860s up to the 1920s, and then I'll talk about the poll tax kind of going from the turn of the 20th century up to the 1960s. That's the two stages. And then at the very end, I'll kind of have a half point about contemporary race-based disenfranchisement. So the 19th Amendment. A uh, famous amendment took a very long time to get ratified. I'm going to try to tell a story that, that sort of shows how suffragettes, people who favored ratification of the 19th Amendment, strategically moved between the national and state level. In 1866, Congress is considering expanding the right to vote uh, to not only black men, as it will in Section uh, 2 of the 14th Amendment to some degree, and certainly in Section 1 of the 15th Amendment, but also in the, a proposed amendment for, uh, by James Brooks of, of uh, New York, Congressman James Brooks of New York, also is considering expanding the vote to women. So it looks like there might be this moment after the Civil War ends in 1865 where you get this expansion of the franchise. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton joined Frederick Douglass in forming the American Equal Rights Association in uh, 19, six, uh, 1867, uh, trying to get the franchise for both uh, black men and for women generally. But they largely fail. Uh, the, uh, in the latter, uh, the 50, uh, 14th and 15th Amendments uh, address uh, uh, race-based disenfranchisement. The 14th Amendment, uh, Section 2, refers to disenfranchisement of men on the basis of race. And so you see suffragettes continue to push Congress for an amendment like this. They continue to have these congressional hearings. Uh, in 1884, Senator George Vest of Missouri says, we don't have enough enfranchisement of women happening in the uh, far west, in the west uh, which is just beginning to uh, be incorporated into the United States. Um, we see a little bit of suffrage happening at the municipal level, but there's not a lot of enfranchisement. And so uh, the Chicago Daily Tribune in 1887 says, changing the Constitution, referring here to the proposed female suffrage amendment, in so vital a respect before a single state has even seriously thought of adopting a female suffrage amendment looks a little weird. Um, Teddy Roosevelt puts it a little, more direct, uh, a little more directly 20 years later. He says, uh, you know, at, at, after suffragettes have gotten a few states in the West, he says, uh, when they come to petition Teddy, he says, go back west, go get another state. And so that's what happens is, is female suffragettes move state by state through the West, and there are states coming in for the first time, like Utah, uh, which writes in 1896 its first state constitution enfranchising women. Um, uh, Montana, which sends the first uh, female member of, of Congress, Jeanette Rankin. Uh, Wyoming, which is the first state to enfranchise women. These western states, which are new progressive states, are trying to attract female settlers, are a lot more willing to enfranchise women under their state laws or uh, because franchise is regulated at the state level under their uh, state constitutions. Uh, and so, increasingly after these successes, uh, suffragettes realize this is a viable strategy. In 1890, the two main suffrage associations, the American Woman Suffrage Association and the National Woman Suffrage Association, merge into the National American Woman Suffrage Association, the NAWSA. In 1893, they have another convention, and one of the delegates, Claudia Quigley Murphy, points out that members of Congress from these western states have more and more women in their constituency. That is, to get elected or to get re-elected, they're relying on women who form their uh, the, the, uh, electoral coalitions in, in their home districts and states. 
In order to get more members of Congress like that who are sympathetic to a suffrage amendment, who rely on, on women for re-election, uh, you need to flip more states, especially in the West. So the idea is to build this national campaign moving from West to East, enfranchising women state by state until you can flip Congress, until you get more states which have electoral college delegations selected by women. So they go state by state, and you can kind of see the story evolving. So I want to tell you two stories about this. This is a parade in 1913. It's a national suffrage parade. Suffragettes march from the White House down to the United States Capitol. It's a famous parade, and when they reach the Capitol, they present a, a petition for an amendment to the Constitution to enfranchise women. And you'll note a few things. One is that they, they march by state delegation. They carry state placards. Here you'll see uh, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, Utah, and Idaho displayed California in, in 1911, first enfranchised as women, and women are canvassing by car for the first time in the state. Um, one kind of outcome of this, though, is that when you enfranchise state by state, you move from west to east. Western states are predominantly white, and so you have a movement uh, led by white women in which most of the constituents are white women. This is the Howard University Delta Sigma Theta chapter, which had formed about two years before this, which is forced to march at the back of the parade. And you see a similar, uh, uh, similar pattern happening where southern states where most black women live are the ones that are least likely to have female suffrage uh, reform happening. I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Similarly, you see suffragettes. This is an Alice Paul um, uh, um, petitioning the president, Woodrow Wilson, for a fem uh, female franchise amendment. Um, and they make this point, which is, is that by 1916, by 1920, these presidential elections, uh, states that uh, allow female suffrage are uh, increasing in number so that uh, the electoral college delegation from these states also is increasing. Presidential candidates now have a reason to support female suffrage. Um, so Carrie Chapman Catt, she's a strategist who uh, is also president of the NAWSA, the main female suffrage organization. And in 1916, she has this national convention. She brings together the state level heads of the NAWSA into a back room. She puts a map on the wall and she says, we're gonna go state by state and now we're gonna, we've captured the West. We're gonna now try to get the Midwest and the Northeast. The South, again, is still largely off the board. Uh, she is trying to replicate Illinois' 1913 suffrage law in other states um, in order to, uh, again, push the right to vote nationally. Uh, to, quote, assemble 36 and then 48 divisions to move on Congress with precision. 36, that's the number of states you need to ratify an amendment. Again, the goal is always the national suffrage amendment. It's a state-by-state -state fight, though. It starts in the West, and the goal is to capture, again, the Midwest, and then maybe the Northeast. Uh, the South solidly opposed uh, white Democratic state legislature, legislators unwilling to enfranchise black women. Uh, but there are uh, sort of holes in that. Uh, this is 1917, 1918, Texas flips, uh, also Oklahoma follows. Uh, and then by 1920, you'll see that a number of states uh, have shifted to partial or full enfranchisement. Uh, and what this does is it changes the national political geography. So you'll see here the dashed line uh, is number of states with school tax or municipal franchise. It's also got presidential franchise and uh, full franchise, the solid line is number of female franchise amendments. And there are female franchise amendments being proposed by a handful of members of Congress for decades, but it's not really until the number of states uh, enfranchising women in one capacity or another, it's not really until that picks up, but afterwards you see a shift in the uh, um, in congressional willingness to propose amendments, partly because the uh, shift, uh, there's a shift in the composition of Congress. More members of Congress are, are, are elected by women. Presidents increasingly rely on women for their re-election uh, by the uh, 2020 election. States enfranchising women uh, are uh, heading into the 2020 election. State, uh, sorry, 1920 election. States enfranchising women um, now form a majority of the Electoral College. So I would argue that it's that prior state reform that makes it possible to amend the national constitution. States converge on a uh, platform of a policy of enfranchising women in ways that make it palatable for Congress to pass this amendment that for decades they have ignored. So I'm going to try to tell a second similar story here about the poll tax. As Western states are enfranchising women, the Republican Party now has a bunch of constituents in Western states, 
And while the Republican Party, especially after the Civil War, had relied on enfranchising black people in the South, it sees this new Western electorate and it gradually kind of rolls back its commitment to the black vote. In 1890, you see the last time that the Republican Party sponsors a strong civil rights bill, the Lodge Force Bill, uh, that would have uh, protected the right to vote for black people in the South. So you get this cascading situation where after 1890, a number of state constitutions, a number of state constitutional conventions assemble. It has its Mississippi plan, which includes a poll tax, a literacy tax, a character test that allowed local registrars to make these arbitrary decisions in ways that pushed out uh, black voters in the South. And also a poll tax, which would require you to put down one or two dollars in an amount fixed in the state constitution in order to vote fell hardest on the states working poor, predominantly, again, on the black working poor in, in states like Mississippi. It was called the Mississippi Plan, and it spreads like wildfire. By 1902, every southern state has rewritten their state constitution, partly because in 18, um, 80, uh, 1898, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a case called Mississippi v. Williams, says that these sorts of poll tax clauses are legal. Now, how could they be legal? We know the 14th and 15th Amendments say you can't have race-based discrimination, but Mississippi, in this case, appeals and says, the poll tax does not mention race. It is facially race neutral. There's no language in it that mentions race. And the Supreme Court accepts this argument. It says, the poll tax is not a tool of racial discrimination. Something that we know is wrong, but constitutionally, the Supreme Court upholds it. Uh, and so it kind of culminates, Alabama writes its current constitution in 1901. This is John B. Knox. This is the convention. You can imagine what kind of document this convention is going to create. John B. Knox is clear about what kind of document they're drafting. He says, and what is it that we want to do? Why it is within the limits imposed by the federal constitution to establish white supremacy in the state. This has happened between uh, 1887, Florida's kind of a very early mover, and uh, 1902, every ex-Confederate state has drafted a new Jim Crow constitution. The Supreme Court largely uninterested through this period in intervening. 1937 case called Breedlove versus Suttles, it reiterates, uh, reiterates its commitment that the poll tax is facially race neutral and does not discriminate on the basis of race. So there's a really high bar to getting the federal act, uh, federal government to actually reverse the poll tax. Um, now, as a result, anti-poll tax reformers like the Southern Conference on Human Welfare and the National Committee to abolish the poll tax, instead they looked to Congress in the following year, 18, uh, sorry, uh, 1938. Uh, the uh, Southern Committee on Human Welfare and then the NCAPT uh, the following year appealed to Congress for an anti-poll tax amendment. But Congress has all these Southern Democrats who realize that uh, if they expand the franchise to black voters in their state, they might lose their seat. The executive branch of the Department of Justice realizes they're kind of cornered here. Uh, in 1941, Colonel vs. Brown, lower federal court, uh, upholds the poll tax, the Supreme Court refuses to hear the case, clear signal to the Department of Justice that the federal uh, judiciary is okay with the poll tax. After that, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Attorney General Francis Biddle says, this is not something that we're going to win. And although FDR is still getting on the phone and making calls to uh, members of Congress, senators, uh, to try to get them to support an anti-poll tax bill, there's just not a lot of traction at the national level, enough that Harry S. Truman in 1945 uh, says that the poll tax is, quote, a matter for southern states to work out. And southern states do work this out. In fact, southern states repeal the poll tax. So again, national government not interested in repeal, but you've got a coalition of progressives at the state level in the 1930s and 40s who do successfully repeal the poll tax at the state level. You see a lot of, of pro-labor and union organizations working together with um, uh, civil rights organizations. Louisiana is the first one uh, to move. In 1934, the Depression spreads. A lot of people can't pay the poll tax. Uh, and increasingly, in Louisiana, poor white workers and farmers can't pay the poll tax. Huey Long, who is a populist in Louisiana, who relies on, on the poor white vote to get reelected, moves in 1934 to repeal the state's poll tax with support from the American Federation of Labor, one of the two large labor unions. 1936, Florida follows. Um, uh, Claude Pepper, who is a, a state lawmaker, uh, again, moves to repeal the poll tax in order to reenfranchise the state's working poor. This is a big emphasis for the New Deal in which more and more Americans are poor, uh, and so they're kind of coalescing around uh, pushing against these uh, discriminatory poll tax um, issues. Also in Miami, uh, the mob is just paying a lot of people's poll taxes to get them to the polls, uh, so it's kind of an anti-corruption measure as well. Uh, 
1941, the Congress of uh, Industrial Organizations and the AFL together uh, organized against the poll tax, as does the NAACP. Uh, Asa Philip Randolph, uh, labor and civil rights organizer, um, a prominent uh, poll tax opponent. And states began slowly dominoing. Between 1943 and 46, a couple of things changed. One, you get inflation, and all of a sudden that constitutionally fixed $1 tax becomes a lot easier to pay. And so the state poll tax loses its teeth. Also, black servicemen are returning home after the Second World War, and it becomes increasingly unpopular to enfranchise black servicemen, uh, to disenfranchise them using the poll tax. So in Georgia, for example, Ellis Arnall, a progressive governor, uh, uh, leads the 1945 measure to uh, repeal the poll tax with, uh, within Georgia. Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi also repeal. And so among the ex-Confederate states, by 1951, the poll tax only exists in Alabama, Texas, and Virginia. Increasingly dead letter in some places, registrars will enforce it in some places. They will. The poll tax by 1951, largely dead. But it's still another 10 years before the federal government is willing to actually recognize the need for poll tax repeal. In 1960, uh, this uh, repeal amendment passes the Senate. In 1962, what becomes the 24th Amendment repealing the poll tax passes the Senate, but only through this very clever procedural uh, measure. It's actually, the amendment is passed as part of a bill to recognize the birthplace of Alexander Hamilton as a national historic monument. Um, it passes partly because, as, as uh, Florida's Senator Spessard Holland says, so many of the southern states have recently eliminated the poll tax requirement. Congress is just trying to lock in what's happened at the state level. And it is important because this 24th Amendment prevents the reinstitution of the poll tax. It also was followed uh, by the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Section 10, uh, also outlaws the poll tax, which the Supreme Court in Harper versus Virginia Board of Elections reaffirms the next year. So 1964, 65, 66, uh, amendment, congressional statute, Supreme Court action. Important work, it prevents repeal of the poll tax. But it's not why we get repeal of the poll tax. It's really only at this period here that you see federal action against the poll tax once down the line, number of southern states, ex-Confederate states with the poll tax, once that number has collapsed. The federal government is only willing to reaffirm what has happened as a result of labor and civil rights organizing at the state constitutional level. And so we would be wrong to say that the VRA or the 24th Amendment or the Harper decision is why we repeal the poll tax. Right? It couldn't have caused it because it happened after it was already there. So I want to give you a couple of lessons, and then I want to talk about contemporary race-based uh, disenfranchisement. One is that if we're ignoring state constitutions, we're not actually understanding national politics correctly. So if we have this story where national controversy creates federal action, and that creates federal outcomes, we're also missing how parallel state constitutional reform causes a lot of the same outcomes. If we only told a story about pressure to reform the poll tax, repeal the poll tax, in which we get the 24th Amendment and the VRA and Harper, we'd actually be incorrectly describing what those amendments did and how they came around, because it was really state constitutional reform that got rid of the poll tax. If we ignore the state constitutions, then we're not actually correctly explaining national politics. The VRA, Harper, 24th Amendment are important for present, preventing rollback, but they're not what actually caused the outcome. Uh, as a result, state constitutions, state constitutional reform, have the power to channel reform away from or to national branches and affect how national branches interact. Uh, the poll tax case shows that state level reform created consensus in favor of poll tax repeal at the national level. Uh, so hopefully I have convinced you all that the U.S. Constitution has survived for so long because we're able to push the pressure for reform down to the state level. States usually, not always, usually act as a venting mechanism in ways that prevent change to the national constitution. And that, I think, is why we're celebrating the Constitution's birthday uh, 234 years after it was first signed. I want to conclude, though, with a story about where we're going now. Uh, and this is, this is pretty short. We're seeing a lot of gridlock and polarization at the state level, and increasingly in competitive states, purple states, we're seeing a repeal of the right to vote. We're seeing suppression of the right to vote. We're seeing subversion of normal election laws. And we're also seeing skewing that uh, increases or over-represents one party through things like uh, race targeted gerrymandering. So I'm going to tell stories about that now. Uh, one, we see something like a modern poll tax where in 2018, uh, Florida voters passed Amendment 4, uh, uh, which re-enfranchised formerly incarcerated people, but the state legislature required that before those people vote, they pay outstanding court fees. Something like a modern poll tax, you gotta pay before you vote. 
Second, gerrymandering. This is Wisconsin's lower house of their state legislature. In 2018, the state uh, uh, the Republican Party lost the popular vote for their state legislature, but they won a majority of seats because they were so carefully gerrymandered that they packed Democratic, especially black voters, into Kenosha and Madison. And then in Milwaukee, they funneled away some of those voters into surrounding red districts. They only got 45% of the popular vote, but they won 63% of the seats. They made it possible that you could lose an election but still win. Wild stuff. Last thing I want to talk about, Wisconsin again, also Georgia. So state legislatures are bound by their constitution to allow or to allocate their presidential electors to whoever wins the popular vote in their state. Almost all states have done this for almost all of American political history. All states, again, currently award their electors on some basis uh, to whoever wins uh, the popular vote within their state. But by amending state constitutions, you can actually break that connection. You can allow state legislatures to go rogue so that and uh, there's a bill in, in Wisconsin that was proposed uh, last year that would allow, let's say, if Donald Trump runs in 2024, he would uh, imagine he loses the popular vote in Wisconsin. The state legislature could nonetheless give him all of the electoral college votes uh, and allow him to win that state after he lost it. And that would be constitutionally valid for a state constitutional amendment. This is called the independent state legislature theory. Four justices on the Supreme Court have already upheld this. Amy Coney Barrett's the fifth. We don't know her opinion because she hasn't heard it yet. Although in a forthcoming case, uh, Harper versus Morris is going to have to rule on it. Importantly, this kind of outcome, we can imagine a situation where a Republican candidate loses the election, but nonetheless becomes president. That could happen through state constitutional amendments. And that's something I'm happy to talk about more in questions, as well as the perennial question of abortion, which is now returning to the state level thanks to the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision. So with that, I thank you, and I look forward to questions.